Welcome everybody to our live event with Ukrainian author and journalist Oksana Forostina. And thanks very much for joining uh, this afternoon. Before we introduce and thank our guests for today's conversation, we'd like to very warmly thank Vox Europe subscribers and shareholders for their support because it enables us to keep hosting such events. We keep translating and publishing very high quality journalism throughout investigations and great cartoons but last and not least, stay independent. So this event is being recorded and this recording will be available on our website in a few days with the best moments of this uh, event. Please, could you write your questions in the chat in the language of your, cho your choice because as Vox Europe, we could translate them in any from any language you speak. And uh, we will activate your microphones about 15 minutes or so before the end of this session, and you'll be able to have an informal chat with our guest. So just now, before we start, we have a tradition here at Vox Europe. We'd like to you to write in the chat box where you're based currently. I myself, I'm Catherine André, by the way, editorial director and co-founder of Vox Europe, and I am based in Paris. Thank you, Catherine. I'm Gianpaolo Cardo, and I'm the editor-in-chief of Vox Europe. I'm currently in Brussels. Oksana, for Two years now, Ukrainians have been living with a full-scale invasion that was launched by Vladimir Putin on 24 February 2022. In their towns and villages, in their flesh and blood, they continue to endure it day after day, without interruption and with no real hope for a quick end to Europe's biggest war since World War II. So while the war in Gaza distracts Europe's attention from Ukraine, no large city in the country has returned to normal. But still, life never stops completely either. In Kyiv, mercilessly attacked this year as the one before, a new normal prevails. So how do Ukrainians live on an everyday basis? Let us present our guest. Oksana Forostina, you're an editorialist at Ukraina Moderna. Uh, you're a publisher, a translator, and an author. And you're a former editor at Critica Journal, and also a regular contributor to Liberties and the European Review of Books, Critica and Visegrad Insight. You were a fellow for the latter, um, uh, you are a fellow still, and you were a fellow at Europe's Futures at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna in 2022-2023. You live and work in Kiev, and I will maybe let you describe, uh, you know, uh, where you're based and how long you've been living in Kiev. And I would like to add that you focus, generally speaking, on Ukrainian and regional politics, as well as disinformation's impact on societies. We're very happy to welcome you, Oksana. Uh, good, afternoon, good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much for uh, for having me. Uh, thank you all who, who joined. I'm very pleased to to see familiar names uh, uh, here. So I'm I'm currently in Kiev. I'm back based uh, based in Kiev and uh, if you uh, walk uh, on the streets of Kiev right now it seems pretty normal uh, like uh, most uh, most European cities you know people sitting in cafes and having having chats and going to 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 work and uh, for the offices uh, are full. You, you can see it in the evening when it's when it's dark. But uh, as we experienced, uh, for example, yesterday, everything can uh, can change literally in in seconds. Uh, for, um, yesterday, actually, we we had the. Um, uh, uh, overwhelming, I would say, attack because the uh, we we had the explosions simultaneously to the air, air raid sirens. So it was uh, literally seconds to uh, to hide, and uh, uh, th that was that was two uh, hypersonic missiles uh, targeted uh, the center center of Kiev successfully hit by uh, Ukrainian air defense, but still uh, 10 people uh, were wounded. Uh, and uh, for, for example, the part of uh, uh, Ukrainian Design and Art Academy building was 
uh, was smashed by uh, by the debris. Uh, so um, uh, that that's that's actually showed uh, how how vulnerable uh, this uh, this illusionally normal life is. Uh, at the same time, one of the stories from from yesterday attacked is uh, the story about uh, a small coffee shop uh, near uh, near the near the near this academy near uh, this uh, uh, ruined building. Uh, the the barista, the girl who who worked there, was uh, actually by by pure pure luck. Uh, for, actually avoided uh, she she avoided the um the a, a, any any damage but the the co the coffee shop itself was uh, was ruined i mean this you know this windows and uh, all the front all the front door everything everything was smashed but in in, in minutes after after the uh, explosions you know in the middle of all this shattered glass she continued. She started to make coffee again, and uh, that's that's a very um, uh, very saying illustration. You know that's uh, how how people navigate navigate this risk and how they they actually how they navigate their fear because we we understand that it's not because she's a superhuman she, it's it's because we adapted to uh, to live life like that yeah thank you oksana and uh, the, the example you just described is kind of uh, exemplary of the, the the resilience the extraordinary resilience and determination of ukrainians to live a normal life despite being involved in this full scale invasion since two years now and this has also probably nurtured uh, Ukrainians' optimism uh, with regards to the outcome of the war, and this is also the, it was the topic of your uh, of the article that um, you've published on Vox Europe. So, um, what is the situation uh, today with regards of this uh, the, the attitude of Ukrainians towards the war and their optimism, resilience, determination? Uh, of course, as I wrote in uh, that article, uh, the uh, the numbers we see are uh, are not the uh, that overwhelming as uh, they were at the beginning of uh, 2023 uh, you know when we all hoped for the quick counter uh, offensive and the uh, quick uh, quick victory uh, during the uh, the last year unfortunately that didn't happen and it's only natural that uh, people are disappointed now. What is more depressing is the risk that uh, the delivery of uh, military aid from uh, from the United States may 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 stop. Yeah, I I I think I don't need to uh, you know to repeat all this uh, very troubling news from uh, from the United States and uh, from the congress uh, of, of course that's uh, um, that that doesn't add optimism uh, but still i i just looked at the numbers uh, and even the most pessimistic part of uh, ukrainians it's uh, 15% uh, as far as i uh, remember in uh, february of this of this year uh, uh people who uh, do not believe who, who are not sure uh, of ukrainian victory even those the most pessimistic part and uh, do not agree to any territorial compromises so they they still believe even those who who don't have any faith even those believe that we should fight for our territories, that we should not agree for uh, any compromises. How do you measure that? I mean, how do you, how can you make sure that um, that's the massive general opinion today? Uh, excuse me? How do you measure this involvement, this, this determination? Uh -huh. Uh, that was the survey. Uh, that was a survey, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. From uh, from the February, uh, actually a month ago. And has it changed 
since the beginning of the invasion? Or has it even, it hasn't uh, decreased? Uh, the, um, the optimism uh, actually decreased uh, since uh, last year. Because we had, you know, like a, a peak of this optimistic uh, uh, hopes uh, at the, uh, the January and February of last year. Basically, a year ago, that was, uh, you know, hope like never before. You know, everybody believed that uh, the the victory is just around the door, uh, around the corner. Uh, so it's, it's uh, uh, it decreases, but still, uh, more people now in these war days are optimistic than in uh, 2021. You know, the the year before the invasion. So this, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, in the mobilization of, uh, uh, of resources, you know, of, uh, of moral, it still works, you know. Uh, I, uh, I always add that it should not uh, be um, a, a signal for the outside world that these patience and this resilience is endless. It is not. You know, because these these resources are not eternal. It's not. It's not. Uh, 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 they are not endless, and it's. Um, it, it, we can expect that. In in some cases, it may it may be worse, uh, but it it will not it will not happen uh, tomorrow. That's I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Oksana, one. A uh, public figure has, uh, for quite some time, uh, embodied this uh, this spirit of resistance and resilience, and at, at least abroad. And it's uh, President Zelensky, who was highly popular uh, at the beginning of the war because he he stood in Kiev instead of getting a, a ride to uh, for getting uh, abroad and, and safe. And is he still uh, popular today uh, after uh, the war, after also sacking the uh, at least as popular uh, army chief of uh, general, uh, army chief of staff, uh, Valery Zaluzhny? Um, mm -hmm. So where is his popularity now and does he still embody this spirit of resistance and uh, resilience? Uh, well, in general, yes. Uh... He, of course, his uh, his ratings and uh, his image um, suffered after the story with uh, Valery Zaluzhny, who was really, really popular, and uh, uh, and still, you know, this despite this this decrease of uh, uh, of popularity since uh, last uh, since last winter, when all this story uh, be became became really really public i mean on an international uh, level uh, his popularity decreased but it's still quite high it's st it's still good numbers i i guess for for any president and he still enjoyed enjoys more trust than before the invasion so uh, i think um, i think in this case, it's a, a very interesting for our local contents. I mean, for Ukrainian contents, uh, the uh, the merge of uh, uh, you know personal pop uh, popularity or popularity of him as a as a person as actually Zelensky and uh, the trust of uh, 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 trust of presidency as as an institution. Because if you look at the numbers uh, for the, I don't know last two decades, the presidency as instit as institution was not among the most trusted in, in Ukraine. Army and church always were well, actually for the for the last two decades at least, but not the president. And I think it's 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 very interesting. Merge for for us, you know, when a, a person and an institution uh, are, are are adding, you know, to uh, to each other, adds uh, add to each other. Uh, so uh, I I would say that uh, uh, Ukraine 
Ukrainians on at large understand that we actually have uh, no other choice but to to stick to Zelensky. Of course, he's he's much criticized. It's uh, it it's not you know it's not a blind faith. Uh, he he is very uh, he's very much criticized, especially by by oppositions on social media uh, and so forth. But uh, still, we uh, we don't have uh, uh, another president, and uh, I'm I'm not sure we will have uh, elections or another president in the nearest future because it's it's impossible what what do people criticize um you mentioned massive criticism so what what kind of criticism are being made and are, is anybody worried that he's been staying in power too long uh, despite the war the invasion of course uh well uh if, again we understand that he uh he stays at power because the, we have no choice there is it's it's impossible to uh, uh to deploy uh, to to have elections now it's it's just impossible if we do it the next president whoever uh, he or she would be uh would be illegitimate because uh, you know many people are in trenches it's impossible to uh, uh, to provide the uh, election there many people uh, many people are abroad you know in europe or in other country and to be honest we don't know for sure how many you know how many are abroad how many came came back it's it's just an impossible task to get it right so uh, no one can have more legitimacy uh, than Zelensky right now and in the nearest future. So we, we just have no choice. On the other hand, he is criticized, first of all, because uh, he, didn't, uh, he does not uh, engage the opposition in uh, decision making. Uh, for, for example, um, the, um, the MPs uh, representing the opposition party uh, uh, um, European solidarity uh, had problems uh, uh, with going abroad. You know, uh, they they cannot they cannot go abroad just just like that. They they need spe special permission. So uh, they uh, they see it as a kind of uh, you know political uh, political pressure. Uh, so that's um, that's. Uh, main point of uh, of the criticism that there there are Zelensky and several several managers who uh, actually make most of uh, of decisions okay thank you uh we talked about trenches so uh i have this question also about the the frontline reinforcements that are being discussed at the moment so i know it's not a certainty yet but some people have stayed now fighting in trenches for many, many months and probably more than a year. What's the situation now, uh, as far as you know? Uh, well, uh, there is a huge problem uh, for the, the, that's, that's uh, correct with people who, uh, for example, uh, went uh, as volunteers at the beginning of the invasion or uh, they were conscripted uh again two years ago and they still in trenches of course they exhausted and of course uh we badly need this uh this rotation and these people should come uh come back home to to their families but there are a lot of obstacles uh to that uh the the current law is uh, far from perfect Actually, there there is kind of a, a flaw in this uh, in this uh, in this law, and that's why we have this problem with uh, with rotation because that was not clearly defined by uh, by the law. Uh, and the new uh, the new law is uh, um, hugely and. Uh, uh, I would say heatedly discussed in uh, in society on I would say on many levels. I mean the issue itself it, uh, is discussed maybe on 
every level, you know, not only in, in the parliament, not only on, uh, you know, on TV, uh, in in the social media, but also, so to say, in in people's uh, kitchens, you know, and uh, the bus stops, because that's what uh, everyone uh, everyone is engaged uh, this this way or another. Almost all of us uh, have. Uh, um, have someone who uh, who are in the army, if our friends, relatives, uh, you know, the uh, significant others, and, uh, and so forth. So you'd say there's no resentment of any kind from one part of the population being maybe oh. very much involved through the family or their husbands or or, or sons or and the women also are at the front. So how? Is it? Do you still feel there's a strong unity from what you're saying? Of course, there is uh, this resentment. It's uh, absolutely predictable, absolutely under uh, understandable that uh, people, especially the women, uh, who uh, who is waiting for their for their husbands or for other members of their families for for two years. Uh, who are in constant stress, you know, like like every minute of uh, of their of their lives, uh, they they are resentful. It's uh, it's quite quite understandable. It's very hard for them to to see that uh, other people, young men especially, you know, on the streets, you know, having fun sometimes. You, but 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 still you know we we have this discussion ongoing in uh, in society because we also understand that not only the front lines but also ukrainian economy uh, needs people <laughs> there are, there are, we we uh, we are surviving the huge toll uh, and uh, huge, uh, you know, exodus uh, of people, and that of course the economy suffers. Of course, uh, the infrastructure suffers because we we lack people, and people people die every day. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Oksana. So, you you mentioned earlier the fact that there is an uncertainty uh, currently. Uh, with regards to the support uh, of the USA in terms of uh, weapons, mostly uh, also financial to some extent, um, for internal political, uh, for the inter because of the internal political game in the US, um, and the US were considered as the main supporter of Ukraine. Um, but there is also another big supporter, which is Europe and the EU. So how are how is the European support uh, perceived in? Uh, in Ukraine, uh, also considering that uh, many Euro people in Europe are talking about a necessary peace uh, that should come at some point, uh, but maybe with a different idea than uh, the one that Ukrainians have on what is peace. So subsidiary question would be, what does peace mean for Ukrainians right now? Mm -hmm. uh, well, as far as I know, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, we still have public support uh, of Ukraine in Europe, in European countries. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, according to surveys, as, uh, the, the, the last time I checked, at least. Yes, you're right. Uh, so, and uh, as again, um, there is a paradox, I think, in Europe that this public support of Ukraine is... Uh, uh, well, it looks like it's higher, but it it is uh, less obvious than you know the skepticism of uh, some European elites, you know, to, uh, towards uh, uh, Ukrainian support. At the same time, in uh, in Ukraine, the trust in European Union is still very high, over eighty percent, so almost ninety percent. So it's it's something that is stable. So Ukrainians still believe in uh, European in the European Union. They still believe in NATO. They still believe in United States, Great Britain. Uh, I mean, United Kingdom is very much trusted and is very very popular in Ukraine, and also and uh, Germany. 
despite you know some uh, you know this uh, problems uh, recent again this uh, military aid still there there is uh, you know this trust uh, in um, in major um, european countries at the same time and uh, that actually uh, that actually makes my my heart bleed uh, the trust in Poland dropped dramatically uh, because of the farmers' protests, you know. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the reactions were very emotional on both sides. You know, maybe because you know Poland is very close, and uh, with uh, with Poland, we we have you know the case of what they uh, what they call the narcissism. Uh, of small differences, you know, we are like a dysfunctional family, a dysfunctional, you know, uh, relatives. So uh, every, you know, uh, any any uh, wrong uh, move, uh, uh, you know, causes this very emotional, uh, very emotional reaction. And and it, it's uh, indeed that was uh, that was dramatic experiences for example for uh, Ukrainian. Uh, you know, this uh, drivers, people, several people actually died in in this uh, lines uh, during the, uh, the winter, and uh, I I guess that's uh, maybe the the biggest problem now, both for Ukraine and for uh, for the European Union, because uh, you know this uh, alliance uh, of Ukraine and uh, Poland is vital. And we we just we just can't afford to uh, uh, to be in odds with Poland, no matter what. Yeah, thank you. I have a question I'd like to ask for Jacques André Mayer. Uh, several international voices have called for an end to the Russian-Ukrainian conflict based on the current borders. Are Ukrainians ready to give up part of the territory for the war to end? Mm, I will. Uh, do we have this on on chat? Because I yes, it's on the chat. It's a <laughs> bit further up, maybe. Uh, Jacques André Mayer. Do you want me to ask the question again? Uh, no, uh, I will try to check it. And um, what? Um, mm -hmm. It starts with question. Several international ah, yeah, voices. Mm -hmm. Uh. We we have these discussions almost constantly. I was a part of recently of one of uh, such a discussions on the Chatham House rules, and we uh, we looked into some service. Uh, and I can say for certain that Ukrainians will not give up any of the territories. That's you know that's that's just. Uh, uh, against uh, public opinion that's against international law and uh, even if you know the whole world uh, pushed on Ukraine you know to uh, to give up some some territories I think no politi you know no uh, politician or any any public figure in uh, Ukraine would agree to that of course anyone who matters. Anyone who has uh, who has something to lose, hmm. that would be a political suicide. So, maybe a question that's a bit linked to that is um, well, Vladimir Putin and some other Russian officials and TV stars uh, often use the nuclear threat to scare Western public opinion into pressing Ukraine for negotiations. Um, you, you also partially uh, reply to that, but what do you Ukrainians think about this uh, nuclear threat? Is it something that is scares them as well? Or? Uh, you know, they keep saying that for more than two years already, right? And uh, they used to say that if Ukraine attack uh, attacks Crimea, it will be, you know, a nuclear uh, uh, nuclear uh, attack on Kiev and uh, other native countries, blah, blah, blah. But we already, at this moment, as we speak, uh, Ukraine uh, 
destroyed one third of Russian Navy in Crimea. You know, one uh, third of Russian fleet. And no nuclear uh, hit as we speak. So I think it's just a bluff. And uh, unfortunately, this bluff st is still working. It's and that's that's very sad. So uh, mm -hmm. as uh, what Ukrainians uh, uh, think of that uh, again uh, last uh, uh, last winter. Uh, we uh, we had you know a myriad of these uh, jokes and uh, stories uh, online uh, because some uh, group on social media you know some of this uh, um, private chats uh, prepared an orgy on uh, in the center of Kiev on one of the uh, Kiev areas in case of uh, nuclear strike. You know, so that's that's a kind of Ukrainian Ukrainian uh, mem. You know, an orgy uh, in case of uh, nuclear strikes. So that's how we see it, basically. Putin has used the terrorist attack in Russia to blame Ukraine, despite it is claiming responsibility. So he didn't mention it actually for the first forty eight hours. And so, what are the reactions in Ukraine? Uh, and what do you think? I know you also a specialist on disinformation. So. He, he he did this this attempt to blame this ISIS attack on Ukraine seems of course uh, you know huge, but he's is using very finer means to destabilize, of course, the public opinion. Uh well, uh, uh, ju just the same time, uh, to say to save our time, I I will say that uh, it's it's uh, it's just nonsense, and you, uh, no one takes it seriously here in Ukraine. You know, I uh, I don't think that even uh, this you know few percent uh, of uh, Ukrainians who may trust uh, Russian propaganda take it seriously because it's obviously uh, obviously nonsense but again that's uh, that's a usual uh, tactic uh, uh, usual approach of Russian propaganda you know to uh, you know to spread a million of different uh, absurd, versions you know just to uh just to confuse people you know just uh, it, and uh, it uh, it doesn't even have to look real you know or to sound sane it just you know the the, the whole idea is to to create a mess that's it yes there's a question from uh, the audience from uh, alexandra who asks, what is your personal opinion of the current Russian opposition, be it uh, in exile, which is the biggest part of it, sadly, or uh, uh, within Russia? Do, do you think it has any chance of changing something in uh, Russia? Uh, well, um, I, I can't say I follow all of them. And... Uh, and uh, I I can't see it clearly, honestly, because I I can't see the clear message from from Russian opposition, you know, and uh, it seems to me a very dubious idea, for example, to to appoint uh, for, uh, Navalny's widow as the leader of uh, of the opposition, you know, like like a kind of of Tsarina. I think it's even disrespectfully to the idea of Russian democracy in in future. Uh, so I I would say that we uh, in general, you know, uh, the 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 international media coverage and the focus of our attention uh, look too much on uh, on the Russian op opposition in exile, and uh, we know less and uh, less about the opposition uh, in in Russia and uh, uh, particularly the liberation movements which are not ethnically Russian like for example that was in uh, Bashkortostan I'm not sure that uh, I'm not sure that we have the 
um, the idea what's really going on there because uh, I'm uh, I, I think that's the you know this uh, this kind of on unpredictability that we should focus on not the you know the, the declaration from uh, from Euro from European countries and from Russian opposition in exile and again, we we Ukrainians we have uh, uh, our own focus on that you know for for us the uh, important thing is uh, how much in um, and uh, in uh, in what uh, uh, in, uh, in what form uh, that or that Russian opposition leaders or Russian opposition groups support publicly the idea of Ukrainian victory? Mm -hmm. Do they wish Ukraine to win? Uh, because just, uh, you know, just saying that, oh, war is terrible is not enough. You know, the, the actual clear uh support what is what uh makes sense for us uh as to uh russian uh, media um i i can't uh unfortunately name any uh russian media i mean russian media from russia that uh, i i trust and that uh, i read I even have... the ones in exile even the ones in exile like gazeta novaya europa or no, uh, no. It's, okay. a long, uh, it's a long conversation. We have also the discussion within Ukraine about Medusa and Nova Gazeta and uh, uh, and other. And uh, we we have many questions. I would I would say it so because again that's that's very uh, that's very long long story and a long uh, long discussion. I have some colleagues who are very much in this you know, opposition movements within Russia and uh, they they have the information from other resources, not not Russian media. Um, I'm just going to ask you, ask some questions from the chat. Um, I have one from Laura. Uh, what about Ukrainian children deported in Russia? What is the sentiment in Ukraine, and there was another one. Maybe I ask it as well. Now, this uh, decolon the decolonial movement in Russia seems to grow. Maybe it will be able to play some role. Thank you. Uh, well, regarding children, that's actually the main reason, I guess, uh, why Ukraine may not, and Ukraine and Ukrainians may not agree on any uh, uh, to, uh, compromises and any uh, giving up of uh, Ukrainian territories, because that's literally mean means that we agree that our children, Ukrainian children, will be uh, for, you know deported basically kidnapped from uh, from their parents as it it's uh, again it happens right now as we speak we uh, also have this you know uh, uh, investigation about what's going on on uh, on the occupied territories about parents who are basically blackmailed and uh, some of them uh, had no other choices but to send their children to these, uh, you know, so-called camps in in Crimea, and they then they didn't uh, see their children, uh, and that's actually tragic, uh, tragic stories, and that's why we uh, we cannot agree on uh, on any compromises because actually it's we we basically we talk about hostages, our people. Uh, and uh, as for uh, the colonization movements in in Russia, uh, we um, uh, actually uh, have kind of consensus in uh, in Ukraine, at least in in my bubble, I would say, and uh, we also have it in written um, about our our idea, our vision of the uh, sustainable peace. For Ukraine, and the only option uh, we have uh, is disintegration of uh, Russia in its current form. 
you know, so the, that's uh, the only ch uh, chance for Russian democracy uh, actually to, to rise uh, one day is uh, the disintegration of Russian Federation uh, for, uh, for, you know, for se several, uh, uh, several some, some kind of, you know, countries or republics or whatever that will be because uh, for, there are a lot of uh, uh, people in uh, in Russia who are oppressed uh, on on the ethnic basis. Some of them for centuries, and actually that's what we saw here in Ukraine because uh, this uh, you know this oppressed these discriminated active groups were the first to be uh, conscripted uh, for for the war in Ukraine. You know that's the poorest regions, that's uh, uh, under the most undeveloped uh, regions. So this these people, uh, in many cases, just didn't uh, have any other options uh, but to to go to Ukraine and to kill Ukrainians. Jacques Henri asks um, that if Trump is elected, his plan is to reduce, and he mentioned it this earlier, the aid U.S. aid to Ukraine and. Is Ukrainian preparing for this uh, this possibility, and would this uh, lead to possibly more uh, more to negotiations and to uh, a more diplomacy uh, being applied for trying to solve the conflict? Mm, of course, uh, we are very much concerned with uh, with this scenario. And uh, we understand that uh, that uh, will not make our life easier, mm -hmm. no, kindly speaking. Uh, but I, I think we, uh, in this case, we first of all, we feel the support of Europe because uh, European countries, European uh, politicians uh, already uh, consider these uh, options as far as far as I know, so they understand the, um, the that's that may happen, and uh, we uh, again Ukrainians uh, developed uh, again as as much as we can to to our abilities our our own um, military uh, military industry. You know, of course, that's small scales. That's you know these uh, these drones, and we cannot you know we cannot beat Russia with resources. You know, uh, Russia has you know many times more than we 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 can ever have, uh, but uh, we can outsmart Russia. You know, with these small small devices, uh, innovations, and that's what again that's what's going on in in Ukraine as we speak. Okay, I ask um, one question from Herbert Klein. What is your opinion about the young men in other countries who are fleeing the war, even though Ukraine urgently needs soldiers? And uh, another one from Jürgen Schwarz. Assuming the situation of Ukraine becomes worse, with Russian forces approaching larger cities again, do you see any political option of higher mobilization of both manpower and then industrial production. So regarding uh, regarding men in in Europe, of course, um, there is a kind of resentment in uh, in Ukraine regarding these uh, these people. Part of them are uh, totally legal. Uh, uh, they 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 came to Europe totally legally because they have free children. Or, for example, children with uh, disabilities. The way well, we 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 have to, uh, you know, give people the benefit of doubt always. Um, of course, some of them uh, just just fled. Uh, we, again, we we have a discussion within Ukraine. What will we uh, do after the end of war? What will be a Ukrainian approach to these people after after our victory? Let's say so. Uh, 
uh some some people uh, think that uh, they should not uh, they sh they should not come back that sh they should be stripped from uh, uh, ukrainian citizenship uh well but on the other hand we still need people again because the demographic situation is uh, is tragic i would say for uh, the, the perspective is is grim uh so um i will i would say that's one of uh, our um, our internal discussion at this point kind of emotional i think it will become more rational in in, in future i hope so and uh, as for conscription uh our uh, our army ukrainian army was not totally reformed before uh, before the invasion we still have a lot of work to do there's still we still have a lot of uh, bureaucracy and uh, un, and red tape within the the army i think everyone acknowledges that that's it's not a top secret uh, on the other hand uh, ukrainians uh, do what they usually do if uh, uh, when they uh, you know when they deal with uh, troubled uh, institutions they create parallel institutions and uh, uh, ukrainian approach to this problem of conscription is basically recruiting on the voluntary basis so one of uh, ukrainian uh, HR agencies, you know, like uh, recruiting agencies, usually they, they look for, you know, managers and engineers and so forth. Uh, now they, uh, they also recruit um, soldiers to, to that. So they, they not only work with, you know, companies and corporation as uh, they, they did before for many years, but also with army. So, and uh, that works because uh, in this case, people uh, have choice. They can find a position for uh, themselves in the army, for example, if they're engineers or if they're accountants, you know, uh, because army is a huge mechanism. It's not only about fighting. There are a huge infrastructure and there is a lot of work not, you know, um, uh, not connected with uh, even with weaponry, like uh, you, you know, so supply and everything. So managers, uh, you know, again, accountants, uh, uh, press officers, uh, uh, IT specialists. There are a lot of uh, you know jo job uh, opportunities. I would say so. And uh, uh, in the, the in some cases, this uh, this works because in. The, it's uh, this all this problem with conscriptions is very much connected with uh, Ukrainian inherited distrust in uh, institution and in state in general. Because throughout our uh, history, the state was usually an enemy. The state was something something like a threat, you know. And uh, any um, any kind of uh, uh, you know. Of, uh, violence i would say any kind of uh, uh pressure uh, or, or immediately almost almost immediately uh faces uh, this uh, this reaction you know that's why many ukrainians fled you know that's kind of uh, kind of instinct that so my my uh, my hope is that this recruitment mechanism may at least uh, uh you know uh, release uh, release some steam from this issue thank you Alexander. i have one last more personal question it doesn't need to be very long but just before we open the microphones and i know there may be two or three questions that we haven't had the time to ask people can you could ask them directly to oksana so oksana just a question you're a translator and you do translate from russian as well and i just wanted to know how does it feel today? I know some Ukrainian authors, or Ukrainian authors, or uh, journalists decided to solely work in Ukrainian. Is how? What's your relationship now with the Russian language? 
Well, uh, I translated only one author from uh, from Russian, and uh, he is he is my friend, and he is so, uh, Soviet dissident, uh, Igor uh, Igor Pomerantsev. Uh, so that was uh, very. Um, He's the father of uh, of Peter Pomerantsev. Peter. Yes, and I'm very I'm very proud of our friendship, and uh, I'm very proud of uh, our cooperation and uh, and his trust uh, in me. Uh, otherwise, I translate from uh, from English, and uh, for example, I also translated uh, the book of two Russian authors, Andrei Soldatov and uh, Irina Baragan, uh, who are well known investigative Russian journalists, and they investigate uh, FSB, uh, Russian uh, Russian special services for for years. But I translated them from from English. Uh, the, the text was uh, from English. Uh, you, again, in Kiev here. Uh, if you go on the streets, you will hear much, much more Ukrainian language than before the invasion. That was, uh, um, you know, very, um, uh, very decisive, uh, decisive, and uh, uh, partly emotional. Uh, a choice for uh, many people in the first for the first days uh, of uh, of invasion. You know, they decided that from now on uh, they they would speak uh, they would speak Ukrainian. It's not easy for many of them, but uh, uh, again, that's uh, um, that, that's something that you you may notice. Um, we also uh, we uh, we have some ch actually these changes began years ago you know but they they were you know like step step by step and uh, mostly uh, implemented by uh, by state by Ukrainian parliament and it was again again ongoing discussion all the time but this time that was a kind of grassroots movement you know that was individual de decisions on the huge scale 